this is the second time I've given this talk, and I hope I've got it polished enough. Am I too loud? Um, how many of you have studied with me introduction to sociology or? Oh, not that many. Okay. Um, because many of you know that I like to tell stories. So this is going to be the story that has kind of informed my life. It is the story that tells you why I do what I do and why I teach what I teach and why I'm involved with prisoners and why I want to understand perpetrators. Because my own life started out because of the genocide in and on the Holocaust, the Shoah. So let's have the first slide, please. Um, I'm going to read a paper that I wrote, um, but I'm going to tell you the story and then read and then tell you the story um, because it's a narrative. Um, it's about to be published uh, by B'nai B'rith magazine. They picked it up for the March edition because they think it's an interesting story. And it certainly um, is not depressing. It might start out depressing. Don't get depressed here because there is a happy outcome, all right? We don't all live happily ever after, but there can be a decent outcome from a very tragic situation. So let me read to you. It begins as I turn out the lights and prepare to settle down for the night. The room is dark. The bed is comfortable and cozy. I eagerly await my restful sleep, but I am still awake when a cold feeling comes over my body. I begin to be anxious, for I know what is coming. All of a sudden, the fear takes over, visceral and terrifying. I am falling into a pit. It is a large pit, emptying into an abyss that spirals downward. The spiral reaches into infinity, and my fall down the hole goes on forever without end. I stay conscious. I begin to think that this life I know will cease and that everything I know to be reality is in fact temporary. I live, the life I live is an illusion to be shattered and end with no control on my part. I will die, it is inevitable, and the world will go on without me, my existence wiped out in an instant. Completely conscious, I am falling forever into this pit it is my death, and I, it will never end. The pit is dark. The farther I fall, the smaller it gets. There is no one to help me or to save me. I must deal with it myself, as I have done since the horror began, as I have done since I was 11 years old. My father said I would outgrow it. My husband held me when I was a young woman, telling me he was there for me. Now I have these day mares alone. They have come for 59 years. Will they ever end? So that's the beginning of my story, starting at the age of 11, when I start to have these waking terrors. That, and I would have them probably once every couple of weeks, and I'd be falling and falling and falling and falling and falling forever into this abyss but I'm awake as I experience this. And so I would jump out of bed, I would run to my father, I would run, I would read, I would do anything I could do to escape this daymare, I call it, but nothing ever stopped it. And I continued to have these daymares for the rest of my life. So let me read you another piece and then I'll tell you more of the story. This is how it all began. We are sitting in a car in the dark. We are waiting, my brother and I, for our parents to emerge from the apartment in Brooklyn, New York, where they went upstairs hours ago. We do not, not know why we are sitting down here, but we continue to wait. When he went up, my father was hopeful and eager to meet with whomever he had come to see. He seemed wary, but anxious. Many hours later, my father emerges, almost carried by my mother, helped into the car as if he is an invalid. He is weeping, quaking, actually. He looks like a broken man. So much did he age in those few hours in that apartment. 
We don't know what happened, but we know something horrible occurred. Silently, we drive back to Boston, many hours away. We sit in silence, knowing that we should not say anything. Could we have the next slide? I'll explain in a minute. We drive away, sitting in silence, knowing we should not say anything. Nothing more is ever said of that evening. My family guards the secret well. Over the many years since then, I have tried to understand what happened that night, but the pieces never fully come together. This is the family that my father left in Lithuania in 1939. That's my father on the upper left, his brother Herschel, who was 17, his sister Althea, who I used to look like when I had black hair, uh, my grandmother, and my grandfather. Oh, thank you. I forgot my little thing. Um, so he left in 1939, and he was the eldest son, the first to go. And he, his sister was supposed to leave and go to the United States, but my grandfather was ill. And so she said, you go first, and then I'll come afterwards. Send us the money. Send us the money to, to get us back get us to the United States. Well, um, eventually the war broke out. My grandfather died of natural causes. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you very much. My grandfather died of natural causes, and my um, family um, stayed in Lithuania. My father, by the way, was the last Lithuanian of seven uh, exit visas allowed that year, 1939, only seven. During um, the buildup to the war, during the beginnings of the Holocaust, it had already been going on in other parts of Europe, but came to Lithuania a little later, 1941. So in 39, he crosses Germany with an SS guard with safe passage to get to La Havre in, Paris, in France, and then takes the boat to the United States, where he comes, and then, next slide, he meets my mother, uh, Ida, and those are the two children. I'm the one on the right. Um, sure have changed. Um, and let me go on. So when he got to the United States, he was inducted into the US Army, sent to North Carolina, did not actually get sent to Europe because the war ended before he um, was sent over. Um, and then he just stayed in the United States and worked as a junk dealer, uh, which was what a lot of people were doing in those days. We'd call them recyclers now, but he would collect um, uh, pewter and gold and whatever people were throwing out, rags, and sell them and resell them. That's how he made his living by day. By night, my father was a biblical scholar. He had studied in Lithuania uh, in the yeshiva, which was a place where young men would be trained to study, perhaps become rabbis, perhaps not, but certainly be well-educated in all aspects of traditional Orthodox Jewish religion. And he continued to live that. When he was on the boat, he had thrown away his phylasteses, which are the, some of you might have seen this, where Orthodox men wear little boxes on their heads and their arms, and they pray every day um, using these phylasteses. Well, my father had thrown them into the ocean when he came to the United States thinking, I don't want anything more to do with all of that. As soon as he got to the States, he bought another pair and continued to pray for the rest of his life in the morning. As a matter of fact, when my father died, many years later, the doctor realized what his physician realized what a righteous man he was and paid for a beautiful room for him overlooking a river so that he could die in peace while doing his praying. So clearly he was a religious man even though he was a secular man uh, and was a junk dealer. Um, my father would sit all day studying his religious tracts. Um, for many years as he lay dying, he, the physician um, took good care of him and made sure that he was well attended. Next slide. OK. Um, 
this one. Okay. Um, I was born in 1944. I'll tell you what this is later. Um, it's a little premature in my slide presentation. I was born in 1944, my brother in 1949, um, and it was in the mid-1950s when we had taken that trip to Brooklyn. And it was at, in that trip to Brooklyn where my father had gone upstairs and met someone who had survived the genocide in his village. The fact that he had collapsed that day when we were waiting for him I later found out was when he heard the gory details of how his family had been killed. So um, he lived um, knowing all of this and never talking about it. Never mentioned to us what had happened to his family. Never mentioned. He used to talk about the village, Kupiskis. He used to talk about his horse, Charlie. He used to talk about the farm that the family owned and the shop and the house. They were fairly wealthy. They were very well educated. My father's father was a merchant who went to South Africa. They were fairly secular and very well integrated into their little shtetl, their little village. Um, so as I am um, becoming more of a professional, because as I grew up, I decided I wanted to first be a social worker, and then I became a professor of social work. Then I had to get a PhD in order to be a professor, so I became a uh, got a PhD in sociology. And along the way, I found myself personally drawn always to perpetrators. Now, I still didn't know the story of my father and his family, but I was drawn to darkness. I was drawn to the dark side. I was drawn to try to understand why could people do what they did. So first I started to work with men who battered women. Then I started to work with um, prisoners, then I worked with others who had engaged in horrific crimes against other human beings because I wanted to understand why were people doing these atrocities to others. So in the course of all of this, I started to teach a course. I used to teach at Ithaca College in the, in the East, Ithaca, New York, and I was uh, taught a course on the Holocaust because I was drawn to all of it. And I certainly knew that my family had died in the Holocaust. I just didn't know the details. So I took this course, and I went to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC, where I was a visiting scholar. I was lucky enough to go back twice, once to learn and another time to teach as a scholar at the museum. While I was at the museum, I was lucky enough to, um, they have re remarkable archives archives from every town in Europe, lists of people from every village, photographs of people from everywhere in Europe trying to pull together all the knowledge that they can find about what went on in the Holocaust. And so one afternoon, I went upstairs to the archives and I start typing in Kupiskis, Lithuania. And up comes a list. And this is the list that was drawn up by a public health nurse the day after my family was killed in Kupiskis. Public health nurse from the next village, Ponovitz, came to the town, came to the shtetl, little shtetls or their little villages where local Lithuanians and Jews lived harmoniously for years and years. But in this case, the Holocaust had happened and she came and made the list, and let me see if I can find my family on this. Because this was the first evidence. Ah, technology. There we go. Oops, not good. have a better copy in another, uh, later in the slideshow. Somewhere around in here is my family listed. My grandmother, Yentalea, who would have been, I think it said she was 64. My aunt, um, Althea, who was 27, and my uncle Herschel says he was 20, but in fact he was 17 when he died. 
This is the first evidence that we were able to find that the family had been killed. And I ran to the telephone and called my brother, who was living in Massachusetts, and I said to him, there is this list, and it's true that there, you know, we have the accurate description now of all the people who were killed in that village. Um, a few years later, my brother, um, let's see, well, actually, let me, uh, let me put one here. So it's a handwritten list of all the killing of the victims of Kupiskis, compiled by the public health nurse. It sent chills down my spine. And this was the beginning of my attempt to search out the history of my family. Next slide. Oh, here we are. I knew I had a better one. Um, so, now, so in Lithuanian, my family name was Schneerson, uh, which, if some of you know, is a fairly auspicious name in the Jewish religion. Schneerson, um, you all have heard, perhaps, of an Orthodox sect called the Lubavitch. They're really Orthodox. They wear big hats and long coats and curls down their hair, and, and they're praying all the time. They're a very Orthodox sect. Well, my father was related to the head of this Orthodox sect, Schneerson. So whenever, it's like being related to the Pope, all right? So whenever I would say, my name was Schneerson, people would say, oi, oi, oi. Do you know, the, are you related to Schneerson? You know, it's like a really big deal. That's why the, by the way, why I changed my name when I got married. Because I was not Orthodox, I was not observant, and it was hard to carry a name like that if you're not um, observant. So um, here is, it's in Lithuanian. Snyder Kene is my grandmother. Snyder Kante is my um, aunt. And Snyder Kess, Hersha is my um, uncle because they change uh, the names based on gender uh, and age. Um, so what ended up happening was after I found this, I then um, talked to my brother and he called me soon thereafter and told me a few years later, my brother called to say there was a story in the news about a Nazi collaborator in Kupiskis, Lithuania. What, who was about to be deported from the United States for falsifying documents when he immigrated here. On January 14, 2002, the Justice Department initiated proceedings to revoke the man's U.S. citizenship because of his participation in the persecution and murder of Jews and other civilians in Kupiskis in 1941. The complaint was filed, and it alleged that Peter John Bernes, a.k.a. Petras Borbanovich, 79, worked during the summer of 1941 as a deputy to a Nazi-appointed mayor and a police commander assigned to Kupiskis. It stated that Bernes, um, who after his immigration settled in Lockport, Illinois, participated directly in the process of removing condemned prisoners from jail so they could be taken to nearby killing sites. According to the complaint, more than 1,000 men, women, and children, approximately one-fourth of the town's population, were murdered in Kupiskis by armed men under this command. More than 300 other locals were also killed, along with a nine-year-old boy who was arrested and murdered as political prisoners. Bernest worked in an office near the crowded jail where the victims were held without adequate food and, and were beaten or shot to death. So because I have a lot of, um, in Yiddish we call it, um, uh, I forgot the word. Anyway, I have a lot of energy and a lot of interest in this. I called the US deputy uh, the attorney in uh, D.C., and he told me the story. For the first time, this would have been early 2000, finally I heard the story of what had happened. Um, and basically, what had happened was that the family was marched out, everybody was gathered together in the village town square. Out of 2,000 people who lived in the village, 1,000 of them were Jews. They were marched to a pit outside of town and summarily shot and killed. 
So now I have a story and I have a word, a pit, right? A pit. My dream has been a pit and I am falling into it, into infinity. I had no idea they had fallen into a pit as they died. Some collective unconscious, some way of knowing, some early childhood trauma had informed my identity so that I knew my family had died in the pit. And I was now carrying that intergenerational transmission of trauma. There's been a lot written about the intergenerational transmission of trauma. How some people become a memorial candle. Next slide. And people who are otherwise might not have become this kind of a person become the candle who represent those who have died in the past. And so basically, what is it, although my father was a refugee and not a survivor, the family and its demise had long been a fact in my life. I would lived it with it since I was a kid. Invariably, one child is chosen to be the memorial candle, to carry the story, to remember, to dedicate his or her life to the memory of the shower. Shower, by the way, I think you know, means burning by fire, a herb Hebrew term for the Holocaust. Um, one author has written about this. That child takes part in the parent's emotional world, assumes the burden, becomes the link between the past and the future. It was not only, not until my 50s that I could put a name to what it was that I had been doing and feeling for my entire life, that I had to make a difference in the world, that I had to go out there and right the wrongs. In Yiddish, we call it tikkun olam, which is repairing the wound, the tear in the universe, to try to fix that which is wrong in the world. And I knew I was driven to do this. I just never understood why. But by the time I was in my 50s, by the way, I'm now 71. So this has been a more 20-year path rather than a 70-year-old path um, in terms of understanding. And I was uncomfortable with that role. I took it on, albeit non-consciously. The house that I'd grown up in was dark. It was depressed. My father used to make us draw the curtains down because he didn't want the neighbors to see. Of course he didn't. He knew that the neighbors had come and taken the Jews in his village and shipped them off to the pit outside of the town. And as a woman, I was also uh, had a lot of problems because I was feisty, I was outspoken, and there was discrimination going on in my childhood. I was the eldest child but I was also a girl, and in an Orthodox Jewish home, a girl is not um, highly valued, at least not in those days. And so I always felt stupid. I felt like I couldn't be much in the world. In fact, that's why I had to get two masters and a PhD to prove I wasn't stupid um, and keep achieving because of this message of the darkness and the negativity that I experienced. Now, some memorial candle children, those who were the Holocaust, um, uh, have had the transmission of trauma. Some of them stay. Some of them stay in the homes and they wait. And they wait for um, helping the injured family member who survived or bearing witness for those who passed on. I didn't stay. I left at the age of 17 because I knew I had to get out of there or otherwise I would be subsumed in the grief and the darkness of their lives. But to be honest with you, at any given moment, I can tap into that darkness because it is almost genetic at this point, given the history of my family. So um, many times I lashed out in anger, um, but for the most part, I just ran far away um, having a feeling of feeling like I had to survive just the way my father had survived so that I could move on as he had moved on and in order to survive. By the way, I forgot to tell you that before um, the, the Holocaust happened, my father had two years of letters coming from his family and we kept them. My brother still has them. 
Um, and in those letters, it kept describing how conditions were getting worse and worse and worse. How Nazis were coming to town, how there was a military buildup, how they had sent, come for my father to induct him into the Lithuanian army because they knew they were going to be fighting in a war shortly. Fortunately, he had left, and so he wasn't inducted. But they were asking for money because things were desperate in those conditions. And of course, in 1941, and I'll get to this story of what I finally discovered. Um, all right, so why don't we have the next slide? Oops. One of the things that, um, as a result of all of my work around uh, the Holocaust, I actually, um, when I came here, got involved with this lecture series and also got involved with Myrna and Barbara and a number of the Alliance members um, in forming first a um, reunion of Holocaust survivors here in town in the area. Then we developed a Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove. Have any of you seen it as you walk over to, put your hands up if you've seen it. Oh, for those of you who have not, please go check it out. It's really quite lovely, even if I do say my, so myself. Um, it's on the way over to the Green Music Center. It's right near the Alumni Grove. And the way this evolved was after the um, event for the reunion of the Holocaust survivors from this area, um, I spoke to a friend, my friend David Salm, and I said, you know, we need something more permanent on campus because of this lecture series that exists here and the work that Myrna's done and John Steiner before him, her. And so um, I, I asked David and he said, yeah, I can help you with that. Well, he gave me the money. And we built the grove. We got Jan Nunn, who is a sculptor over in the art department, to design it. We got donations from Union Pacific for the railroad tracks. We got donations of glass. We got donations galore. And ultimately, it was opened. We had a very beautiful and moving opening ceremony in which uh, we had Native Americans, Armenians, Rwandans, Cambodians, people from the Holocaust. Um, can you remember any other ethnic groups? We tried Cambodians, right? And we had people from each of those groups come and either sing or chant or dance to show us their culture. But then we also put the bricks in this grove that honored each of the ethnic groups that have had genocides in their history. And um, as a result of having that beautiful grove, and I was there the other day, it's still very powerful to me, um, we then were able, and Myrna wrote the proposal with um, the person in charge of uh, landscaping on this campus, um, wrote a proposal to the Anne Frank Foundation, and we got one of 11 saplings that were cut from the original tree in um, the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, that Anne Frank used to look out at as she was hiding. And so the tree, particularly if you get out there in the spring, is absolutely beautiful. It blossoms. I should have put a picture of it in the slideshow. I'll do it for the next time. Um, it blossoms. It's surrounded by a fence because we don't want anybody to do damage to it. And we now have this very moving site where many people come to honor their dead relatives. I go out there uh, at the end of June, around June 28th, to honor the killing of the, the lives of my family members who were killed in the Holocaust. So please check it out, okay? Um, next slide. So I was aging. I was now almost 70, uh, my brother 65, and we both agreed that it was time to go there. It was time to go see what had loomed in our lives so large and to make a pilgrimage, a heritage uh, visit. And um, it was a, a trip that w I would say was transformative. In fact, I think I'm going back this summer um, because uh, some friends who I met on that trip are now eager to return. So let me see. Does it 
Hey, Sister Street. I have to go see. Oh, Ponovitz, right. That's it. Okay, so we started our trip in Vilnius, otherwise known as Vilna. Um, and I'll tell you about the trip. And then we took a heritage tour. So all of us, 25 of us, joined up here. And then we broke into small groups, depending on where we all came from. So some people went to Kovna, Konis. Some people went up to Belarus. Some people went up to Estonia and Latvia, which were up here. Some people went into this region. But we went up this highway, which, by the way, was about three hours. This is a small, small country. Um, and we ended up staying in Panovitz, where my father had gone to yeshiva, but spent a day trip going to statistics. So, and for the understanding of the Holocaust, one has to understand Germany is over here. And so as the Germans are marching through, they go through German, they go through Poland, and then they start marching through here, heading towards Moscow, which is up in this direction because that's where they were attempting to get to to take over all of Europe. Of course, the Russians in the war fought back and were able to keep them out of the main part of Russia and were able to push them back. And of course, the Allies came in, starting in France and in Normandy and all other parts, and bombing, and it's particularly in Germany and Poland, not particularly in Lithuania. So I'm not going to give you a quick history of World War II. For that, you need to do some reading. Um, but let me tell you about this trip. Okay. So I'm making a pilgrimage. Now, what is a pilgrimage? A pilgrimage is where we walked very, um, well, let me first read this, and then I'll tell you about a pilgrimage. As we approached the field, this is kind of another little story. As we approached the field, we could see a series of pits surrounded by stone walls. Um, these were the pits where thousands of Jews were marched to their deaths. We had seen photographs of this horrible place with lines of people waiting patiently to go to where their lives would end. Now we were here, actually. The souls of those killed were under our feet. Carefully and silently, we all walked in awe of the tragedy that took place there. What were those people thinking as they faced their ends? Were they praying, resisting, going with friends and family? Were they alone? Were they frightened? Were they at peace? What was their experience as they faced the reality that it was all about to end? We were in Panerai, the largest killing place in Lithuania. So that's just an introduction to what it's like when you get to Lithuania and the killing fields. Um, I'm on a pilgrimage, and what is a pilgrimage? A, well, a pilgrim is a person who is in motion, passing through territories not their own, seeking something we might call completion, or perhaps the word clarity will do as well, a goal to which only the spirit's compass points the way. I was looking for clarity about the place my family came from, clarity as to what went on there and what this place is today. I needed to know what I did not know. Thus, I suspended judgment and expectations. Everything that would occur was what was supposed to occur. I would find out. It would emerge. All I had to do was put myself in the place of going, and the rest would all unfold. My destination from an industrial city in Boston all the way back to Lithuania was a pilgrimage that was difficult. My aunt had been very involved in her community, uh, Althea. She had worked as a town clerk. My father had been in the Lithuanian army. He had been in the ski patrol. He had been very involved in his community. Jews were integrated into their communities. Um, this trip was called a Jewish heritage tour to Lithuania. And um, the first place that we went to was a museum. Would you give me my next slide, please? And at this museum, it was called, um, let's see, the Jewish Holocaust Museum. And this is the first day. We end up in a hotel. 
beautiful hotels, nice accommodations, great food. We get in a bus, and the very first place we go, imagine, is a Holocaust museum. And there, the first thing I encounter is a museum that outlined the numerous killing places where the atrocities took place. It housed a letter from an SS Standantapura named Karl Jaeger. This is his letter, who wrote to his superiors in Germany with great pride about how he had wiped out huge numbers of Jews in a short period from June to December of 1941. The letter details were chilling, attesting to the ruthlessness of the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen were, roving, were moving killing teams that would move from town to town to town and kill the Jews and then move to the next town. There's a fabulous book about what these guys were like because I started to get into the heads of the perpetrators. It's called, um, what is it called? Ordinary Men. <laughs> right, Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. And if any of you want to really read a chilling story of what these ordinary men who had been accountants and, uh, you know, policemen, just ordinary men, were recruited to come into these Einsatzgruppen. At first, they're chilled and, and upset by what they're told to do. They're forced to do it. They're made drunk by their superiors. And eventually, they're completely desensitized and go from village to village to village to kill the next group of Jews that they have encountered. So uh, this is a letter that says that um, 25,000 of them had survived. In the beginning of 1941, there were almost 200,000 Jews in Lithuania. By December of 1941, there were 25,000 of them left. And so this is his letter documenting how he had killed off 175,000 Jews in six months. That's quite a feat, a chilling and horrible feat, but it certainly is quite the feat. Um, uh, by the way, a few of the people who were finally able to survive of those 25,000 were eventually sent to, um, to ghettos in Kovna and in Vilna. And they were in, in, um, encircled by fences, barbed wire, Nazis, who would keep them there. And they were forced labor, uh, kept on very strict and terrible rations. People were hiding. So I'm going to tell you a little story about all of that. So by Nine, end of 1941, there are only 25,000 of them left. Those who eventually survived the concentration camp, uh, I'm sorry, not the, Jews in Lithuania did not go to concentration camps. They were killed in sight or they were sent to the ghettos. After the ghettos were liquidated, they were then, the last of them, were finally sent to concentration camps. But they were only about 10,000 out of 200,000 people. When we were at this museum, um, they asked us to step into an attic, a um, little place where we were supposed to experience it, what it was like. So let me describe this. Besides learning all of this, we also had the frightening experience of being in an attic crawl space to feel what it was like for those who had to hide there. Although we were in the space for only a short time, I was appalled. Cramped in with five other people, I felt claustrophobic and confined. I could hardly breathe. I began to sweat even though it was cool outside. I felt viscerally frightened. My skin crawled. I wanted to cry. I stopped breathing and felt as if I was going to die in those few short moments. I could hardly wait to get out, taking quite a while to recover my equanimity. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like to hide for months in a place like that to avoid the Nazis roundup. And yet, these hiding places existed all over with Lithuania, where people tried to save themselves from the inevitable. We then went to a tolerance center where some people are trying to work on. Uh, Lithuania has a huge rise of anti-Semitism right now, starting all over again. They didn't learn from their mistakes the last time. And so there is a tolerance center there 
that is attempting to work with skinheads and neo-Nazis to try to help them understand what happened in Lithuania and then also to um, try to diffuse the anti-Semitism that is growing in that country. I recently heard, you all heard of Mr. Grunberg when he was here, when he was talking about, um, well, um, um, what was his name? My name. I just had surgery, by the way, so um, I'm a little foggy. So Karski, thank you. When Karski was, um, when the, uh, Grunberg was here to talk about Karski, he told me there's a new book in Lithuania, written in Lithuania by a woman who has now documented all of the atrocities that took place there. And she's getting a huge backlash right now against her because of the details that she is bringing forth that have not yet been known. I'm hoping to find that book translated in English so I can learn more. All right, so how about the next slide, please? So, the museum, we went to another location, and this is an area that is called Panerai Memorial Museum. On this site, 30,000 to 100,000 of the Jews of Lithuania were killed. The number is unknown because contrary to what most people believe, no records were kept on the Jews that the Nazis slaughtered in the Baltics. Um, and so it was a very painful place set in a very lush forest. A group entered the park, and this is the main entrance to the park, um, and we passed near a track where the trains that had brought the Jews from to Panerai were to be killed. We could hear the whistles off in the distance, a chilling sound, and we entered sacred grounds. The men put on yarmulkes, which you wear when you're in a synagogue to honor God. Women covered their heads as if they were going to a synagogue or a funeral. Next slide. This is the memorial that we went up to and left candles and rocks. Jews don't usually leave flowers. Um, we don't leave flowers because flowers die, and we leave rocks because we want eternal memory, and, uh, and rocks never die. So that's why they're there. So we said a Kaddish, which is the prayer for the dead at this setting. Next slide. This is where the pits are. This uh, the, the women, the Jews lined up outside of the pits and were marched into this area um, to the killing fields. Eventually, uh, let's see, let me see. Uh, the cemetery, thousands of people were buried in the cemetery, were summarily executed merely for being a member of this ethnic group. Gunshots that killed them rang out around the area as thousands marched through Panerai on their way to their death. So this is one of the killing pits. A guide told us a story of a group of Jews who were tasked with moving other Jews to the killing and then moving the bodies out to where they'd be buried. Eventually, a few of them were able to dig a small tunnel from which they could escape and run to the forest. It was one of the few times Jews could find themselves, save themselves from this horrific place, a testament to human fortitude and resilience. It's the only bright spot in our whole time for our group at Panerai. Next slide. This is it from a distance. So you approach it in kind of this sense of, um, it's like you're walking on, um, Skulls and corpses and, and, and bones. It's a killing field. And so you walk into this place, and many of us were crying because up to 100,000 people died here in these kinds of places. And look how beautiful it is. You know, I mean, it looks like a lovely little park now, 70 years later, 75 years later. All right, how did it feel? This visit made obvious to me why I had come. No longer was the Shoah an artifact of history. No longer was the death of my family just a story. Here is where it began. It was a place that moved me deeply. We walked gingerly, speaking softly, often in tears. It was a place to worship, weep, and mourn for all those who had perished. None of us had ever been anywhere like it, although later on our trip, being in a place like this became a common Lithuanian experience. The only experience that might have come close to this for me was visiting slave dungeons in Ghana, 
where thousands had spent their last days on the African continent being, before being sent off to slavery. In both places, one could smell and feel death and horror all around. Okay, next slide. Then you go on, right? You go from this place. By the way, that evening, I went back to my room and I just wept and wrote in my journal. Everybody else went out for dinner and, you know, they were all having a, I don't know if it was a good time, but we're moving on. But I was um, blown away by my experience. But the next day, another experience happened. Uh, next slide. I'm sorry, go back. This. The next day, we went to the Le Le Lithuanian National Archive. Now, you don't really know what you're seeing, so let me tell you what's this, what you're seeing. At the National Archives of Lithuania, there are documents on shelves, much like our National Archives, that has every record uh, from his, the time it's been written on this country. And they have it by villages and shtetls, the little places, towns where my like one that my family lived in. So I said to the archivist, where is Kropiskis? And she said, oh, right over there. So I pull it off the shelf, and I open it up, and the very first um, story, person's record, is my uncle Herschel's when he was having his bris. A bris is a ritual circumcision, and I just happened upon the record of my uncle's ritual circumcision. So the whole trip felt very like synchronicity, fortuitous. You know, something weird was happening. I wouldn't call it magical because it was more like strange. But now I come upon my uncle's record and there is my grandmother's name, my grandfather's name, the name of the man who did the ritual circumcision my grandmother's birth date, my grandfather's birth date, and Heschel's record. And that's the top one there. Um, I can't really read it very well, and I can't read Lithuanian. So that you'll have to trust me that that's what that says. Okay. So the next day, um, we went, next uh, slide. The next day, we went on a tour of the Vilna Ghetto. Now, the Vilna Ghetto, as I described to you, was a place where everybody had been encircled and moved to. Families were brought, family, uh, and everybody who lived in that area had to move out, and all the Jews had to be moved in. And so we went on a tour of the Vilna Ghetto, and one of the reasons I have this slide, that this is a wall that is probably that high, way up there. And there's no window above it, and there's no window below it, and there's nothing beside it. And somebody carved the Star of David as a sign of resistance in this wall that nobody could reach. I still haven't figured out how they did it. But nonetheless, it, it showed me that, you know, there's always these stories about how Jews went placidly to their death. Not true. Not true at all. There are plenty of stories, including resistance in the Vilna Ghetto, where people would, next slide, would hide out under the sewer covers. They would go down under the sewer covers, go through the sewers, come out of the ghetto, bring in food from outside the ghetto, come back through the sewers, and come up through the sewer covers, the manhole covers, to bring food to people, to bring in weapons to do whatever they could against the huge Nazi machine. And these are, you know, most of these folks were not soldiers. They were just ordinary citizens. Many of them were um, biblical scholars and students and young people. Um, many young people, by the way, ran to the forests and became resistance fighters, partisan fighters. There's a fabulous new book that I just read um, called The Nightingale about resistance in France. Uh, it's on the bestseller list, and I highly recommend it, historical novel, that describes the many acts of resistance that both Jews and non-Jews engaged in against the Nazis, sabotage, any effort that they could make in order to save uh, even several people at a time, rather than thousands. But nonetheless, don't ever believe that people went down 
uh, passively. They did not. Um, we also went to another ghetto um, called Kovna, the Ko a Kaunas ghetto. But the most important part of this trip I will now get into. This trip was very powerful, but the part that was the most meaningful for me, next slide, was going to Kupiskis. Now, that's my brother, um, and that we're there. It's probably the beginning, uh, end of June, beginning of July, two years ago. And um, let me uh, read to you the introduction. As we left the bus, the sky was all be already beginning to cloud over, and it looked ominous. In the distance, we could see a water tower the Soviets had built after they took over the country. They also bulldozed much of the Jewish cemetery, which would have been there for centuries, leaving only a few remnant graves by the side of the tower. As we walked slowly, I was anxious but thrilled. I was finally coming to the place of my terrifying dreams. Next slide. That's the water tower. To the right of the hill on which the water tower stood was a sloping hill with a memorial at the top. Next slide. The translator said it honored the Jews killed in the shtetl in June of 1941. As she read it, I felt moved. We were finally here. It was a beautiful place with a touching statement. The hill sloped downward into a lovely garden with steps and flowers. Next slide. At the bottom of the steps was a small place to stand to look out over the field toward the Cooper River, which my father had told us about. He had said that he had often taken Charlie the horse there over the river from a small farm into town. Next slide. Beyond the trees is the Cooper River. He had said, uh, I could see it now. It was real and moving, quiet, peaceful, nothing like I had imagined in my worst day mare. As we went down the steps, next slide, eight of us were silent, all feeling the sacredness of the place. Beneath our feet were the bodies of the thousand Jews killed there in a single day, more than 800 from Kupiskis and the rest from surrounding regions. My father, my brother took out the prayer book he had so thoughtfully brought and handed them around so we all could say the Kaddish that we had intended. I wept as we recited the old familiar words. And then the skies opened. We were drenched with a downpour that we had not seen coming. Was our martyred family weeping was it with us? Was it mere coincidence? I'd never know. All I knew was that we, had to, we were sopping wet and running for cover since there were no umbrellas or raincoats. Next slide. This is the village of Kupiskis in the 1920s. So we got in the van and left. There I was at the pit, and it wasn't a pit. It was just a beautiful field, and I felt an anticlimax. So I thought, all right, this is it. I'm just seeing it, moving on. So the next thing we do is we go into Kupiskis. And um, that's the old town of Kupiskis. The church uh, has been there since the 1800s. Next slide. This is what it looks like today, just a modern, small little village. Um, and what we saw was, um, let's see, earlier. Um, so basically, this is the town. As we had pulled into town, by the way, at that train station, at that station that you saw a picture of where it said Kupiskis, uh, my brother and I and the people who were with us needed to use a bathroom. So I went in and I paid my little lita, which was the currency. And then um, another person went in. And, and, and then all of a sudden, the woman starts yelling at us. She's screaming at us that we have not paid enough. So the translator went over and tried to help out and figure out what was wrong. But she was an uneducated woman who could not add up the eight lita that we had to pay. So she felt we had not um, paid enough money. And my brother and I took each other aside and laughed because my father had always said, 
don't go to Kupiskus, don't go to Lithuania, they're ignorant people there. Why would I want to go there? They killed my people. And my brother and I chuckled and said, Dad was right, and you cannot piss in Kupiskus. <laughs> so we had a little levity on our trip, right? Because it was so powerful, we had to laugh a little bit. So earlier, um, later, after we had seen the tower, the sun came out, and we go to this village. And Kupiskus, by the way, had had 2,000 Jews, half its population, and had been in existence since the 1500s. Everybody lived there um, until World War II. There was some anti-Semitism, but not a lot. Uh, according to historical sources, there had been mills, private bakeries, tea rooms within the city. Jews had been employed as shoemakers, joiners, tinsmiths, blacksmiths, ha hairdressers, photographers, dyers, um, wool combers, bakers, watchmakers, potters, innkeepers. Many had received funds from their families to begin immigration in the 1800s. And in fact, many of the people who were on my trip were not of the generation that my father came. They were from the 1800s. We were the only ones who were the Holocaust survivor family on the group of eight that were from our region of Lithuania. Um, then we decided to go to our family home. Now, I don't think I have a picture. Let's see. No, this is just more of the town. We had known, yes, yeah, stay there. We had known the address of my father's bill, uh, house, 52 Godimus. He'd always talked about it. So we went to 52 Godimus. And it wasn't there. It was an empty field. And across the street was a police station. So I went into the police station, and the guy came out and started to explain that there had been a house there until probably about five years ago, probably my family's house. But it had been turned into a home for the homeless. And in fact, my brother and I were actually quite pleased that it had been turned into a home for the homeless because we didn't want people who had been taking over our family's home. It was also, um, I found out, that if I wanted, I could become a Lithuanian citizen, which would then make me a member of the EU. I considered it. But the idea of being Lithuanian was not particularly appealing. So I decided against getting EU citizenship. But we went to the house. We saw the house. And then we went to a memorial wall. Now you can change the slide. Next slide. So over the last 15 years, people who had left Kupiskus, who had been survivors, children, and children's children, had put together a memorial wall. We had sent money that was then set up in the town library. So this is the memorial wall. And if you give me the next slide. Oops, back, sorry. Um, go too forward. I think I should have put some, no, OK, back again. So this is the memorial wall. And the wall, in fact, is an exact replica of all the names of the that the woman who was the public health nurse had put together. And so each of these panels is a list of the people who were killed on June 28, 1941, in the pit outside of town. And then at the bottom of it is our names, the people who helped contribute to the remembrance of the family, of the families who were killed there. So that was pretty powerful to go in and see that, since we'd contributed to it. Next slide. We also, uh, this is the backside of that very building. And in fact, that was the synagogue where my father had been bar mitzvahed, which was pretty powerful for me, that this was where my father had, you know, had his family. They had all gone there for the holidays and for the rituals. Um, and it still had a woman's section and a men's section, uh, just as it had during his childhood and my childhood. I had been brought up behind, it's called a mechitza, the divider, where the women stay separate because they're not supposed to distract the men from praying. So then it's all over, and we go, next slide, for lunch. And my father always loved borscht. 
borscht and rye bread. And so we had a typical Lithuanian lunch of borscht and rye bread. And then we get in the car and we leave. And I'm thinking, that's it? This is what I've come for? The pit is not a pit, it's a field. I'm eating the food, I see the place where, you know, is that all? And I came home. Okay, next slide. And there's the rye bread, by the way. So let me read this next piece. Soon after my return from Lithuania, it was my 70th birthday. As is my ritual, I attended a meditation with a guide who helps me see where I am and where I might be heading. It is held at a rustic mountain retreat called Light on the Hill, not far from Ithaca, New York. There is a pond, and a serene and serene nature surrounds us. We can access places I do not go without the help. I told my guide, the owner of the center, about my day map and my trip to Lithuania. As rain pelted the small hut, I was reminded of the downpour at the killing place of my family. It was a perfect setting for my attempt to make sense of my experience. Alice asked me to imagine my daymare pit and the usual falling into infinity. Naturally, I resisted such a suggestion, but I always trust her. I tried to allow myself to go where I generally do not let myself go. I fell and fell and fell, as I had in the past. In fact, I kept falling for quite a while. My day mare is so familiar, it is where I always go. But finally, I stopped falling. I could see a small light ahead. The infinity I'd always imagined was not so infinite after all. The narrow downward spiral began to open up, and I came into the light. I was no longer in my body. I was a spirit. The place I entered was lovely, with a bright blue sky and puffy white clouds. Alice told me that for Buddhists, the, imp the image represents nirvana. As I exited my spiral of infinity, I was met by my old childhood friend, Michael, whom I used to see sitting in the synagogue with my father and the other men. Michael died many years ago, but here he was welcoming me to this place. I didn't even ask where I was. I went willingly because I trusted him. In the background, I could see my mother and father, but they didn't approach. Instead, Michael told me there were some people he wanted to introduce me to. I was met by my murdered ancestors. As my grandmother, Yentalea, my aunt Althea, and uncle Herschel came toward me, they world wordlessly told me that they were all right and in a good place. They said I no longer had to be the memorial candle I had been my entire life. They indicated that I had done my job and now it was finished. Their lives had ended. They were 74 years away from the atrocities now. Their spirits were free and mine should be as well. I realized that Althea's name meant healing and I was about to begin my own. A great sense of relief came over me. I fell to peace. I had done what I was supposed to do, but no longer had the obligation to honor and work for justice in their names. In actuality, I've had a hard time letting go of that identity, and I'm not sure that I will. But I was sure that I was released from the tragedy that had plagued me for my entire life. I've been back now for a while. I've not had the day mare, nor have I been depressed by its loss. I feel compelled to tell my parent, family story, but now it is a story that has an ending. I may not fall down the pit into infinity upon my own death. My ancestors' lives are remembered and honored. I will forever memorialize their stories and will still work to stop some, such atrocities from happening again. I may not be able to, and, but I still feel compelled to try. It has been a life of pilgrimage, but I think the pilgrimage is over. I can now live my life free of their pain and suffering. That was a great gift. That's my story.
So I'd like questions, because it's much more fun. And this is not fun, but it's fun to talk to you about all of this, about second generation, about childhood trauma, about what happened in Lithuania, about the trip, anything. Ask me anything. I'm pretty open. Thank you. Yes. Really? Ooh. Well, I, I actually have pictures of Fort Nine. You have pictures. Okay. Let me tell you about Fort Nine. I didn't put it in the slideshow because Ponorai and Fort Nine is, is probably the third most powerful place that I went to in Lithuania. And it, too, was a killing place. And you go along a walkway, and it's called the Walk of Death. And you walk the path that those who were killed there walked. And uh, there's a huge monstrosity of a Soviet-style um, memorial. And it has bodies reaching up, and it has bodies dead, and it has bodies standing up like this. It's huge. I mean, it has to be the size of three times the size of this room. And it, it's kind of brutalistic art. Uh, you know, Stevenson Hall and Darwin Hall are both called the uh, brutalist school of architecture from the 1950s. And that's the same school of architecture, Soviet architecture, that Fort Nine was. Very I'd love to talk to you afterwards a bit, if you'd like to. It's a very, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back there. I saw other hands. How many of you in this room are second generation? Oh, just two of us. There's a lot more around. I mean, what's that? How about third generation? A couple of you? OK. Well, the trauma continues. My daughter, uh, who is third generation, has nightmares and sleep problems. And she carries the collective unconscious, too. No doubt about it. So I have to leave for another talk later. So I won't be able to visit with you, but I'll be back weeks we could visit. Okay. Well, let me let me suggest when we study here we study genocide. And genocide is an official designation by a government to obliterate a group of people. So the definition is much narrower than that which is taking place with immigrants and any other ethnic groups, because there's no plan by a government to wipe out these groups of people. Those are atrocities. Those are massacres. Those are unacceptable. I completely agree with you. But usually in the discussions here, we try to stay with genocide just because Otherwise, we open a Pandora's box. How about anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, come on. This didn't interest you at all? Thank you. Come here. Oh, my mom. Um, my mom, uh, I, I should have included her, but her, she was born in the United States. Now, interestingly, her mother came from Poland, and she had... 11 brothers and sisters. Four of them went to the United States, four of them went to Israel, and four of them stayed in the Soviet Union, what became the Soviet Union. And those who stayed in what became the Soviet Union were, in fact, victims uh, of the Holocaust. But they were a little more removed from me. So, um, and actually, according to my cousins, probably second and third cousins, probably about 60 people were killed. Uh, in through the Russian um, and, and Poland occupations. Um, and in fact, out at the Grove, I've bought bricks to honor 
her side of the family, but we don't actually have a lot of names. And by the way, four of them stayed in the Soviet Union. Four came to the United States and their children became professors and doctors and lawyers. And the four who went to Israel became, uh, lived on kibbutzim and founded the state of Israel. So we kind of are the story of Jews from the 1800s. So my mother's side, a little more removed. My mother was a very traditional woman, even though she was born in the United States, which is one of the reasons I ran away at 17. It was not a good place for a feisty Jewish girl, so, with a brain. So I was trouble. I was real. I didn't even include that in here. I was really trouble. I mean, I would speak up at everything that went wrong in that family. If my brother got X and I only got Y, they heard about it. So uh, I, was, I was not easy. I got my comeuppance when I had my daughter. So. <laughs> How about others? Yes. That's right. Yeah, they all go as willing victims. And in fact, in Israel, they always really marginalized the survivors because they were going to show that they were the fighters and they weren't going to ever let that happen. Never again. That's the motto, right? So, yes, thank you for mentioning. Myrna has something to say about it. Yeah, I recommend him. He really explains it. There, I, I, I gave a quick and dirty. He goes into the real socialization process, social psychological process. Lynn, I'm glad you're asking. Thank you for asking. That's a great question. Quite a few connections. My, uh, the people that I work with in prison are ordinary men. And they were like you and me when they were growing up. Some of them might have been sociopaths, but not many. Most of them were either beaten as children, they were mistreated, they were shot up with drugs, they were forced to join gangs in order to survive. I mean, I, I don't usually identify with perpetrators, but now that I've worked in prison, I understand perpetrators of, of Nazi behavior and I understand perpetrators of crime because all of them have had experiences in which they were brought into the fold of violence. They didn't start out that way. And if we started to intervene with people early, I mean, in Germany, I don't think we could have done anything, but certainly with prisoners, most of the prisoners that I know are rehabilitatable. There are many who are not. There are some people who, uh, there's a guy who got out last week. He'd been in prison for 40 years for a crime that to this day he said he did not commit. Now you'd wonder after 40 years, why didn't he acknowledge it? Maybe he really didn't do it. Maybe he didn't. But he became, you know, socialized in the prison system. And so there he was, 40 years denied parole over and over. I've worked with men. One guy killed a kid accidentally and did 36 years. You know, he was, he was upset and he didn't know what to do and he was like really angry and he just kind of threw the kid. I don't know how many of you feel angry at kids. I know I did. Um, and it was accidental. He did 36 years. Another guy killed two people and when I, oh, one guy killed his wife and when I asked him why he said, she pulled an, a gun on me and I pushed her and she hit her head and she died and he got, you know, so there are plenty of people like that in prison. There are plenty of people who were gangbangers who committed lots and lots of crimes and have turned their lives around. So 
I really do believe in redemption, even for genocide. Yes. Oh, different ways. In um, the pit, they dug a tunnel under the pit, slow by slow by slow by slow by slow by slow, like. Oh, no, no, these were the people who had been given the task of moving the bodies out. So they were able to escape. In the ghetto, people were able to escape through various underground channels. Um, other people escaped hiding, lots and lots of hiding, like that attic that I described. Or righteous Gentiles who, hit, not many in Lithuania, not as many as were in other countries, but there are some. Um, there's a very good book on the Lithuanian genocide called We Are Here by Ellen Cassidy. And she describes some of the incidents in which people actually hid <coughs> Jews so that they didn't um, were able to survive it. But you know, out of, out of 200,000, not many made it. In fact, when I was there that summer, I met a woman who was from Kapiskus, and she and I were communicating in, in Yiddish, and she said she was one of the, she had left before um, the genocide, but uh, she said that nobody from that region had survived at all. Because once you're marched out, they're gonna round you up. So my father got out, he was one of the last people the of Lithuania. How about others? Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, there's there's a lot of theories about it. Um, there is a, a document that was written called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was written by Henry Ford and others, who allege that Jews are the, you know, the devil, and they are going to eat and kill babies and make matzah out of babies' blood. And so there's, there's the sense that Jews killed Christ and therefore they will suffer for the killing of Christ. I mean, anti-Semitism is ancient. And Hitler blamed the Jews for their failure in World War I and their economic demise after World War I and said it was based on Jewish um, usury and, uh, and money, law, money gains. So uh, anti-Semitism is alive and well all over the world right now. France is a perfect example. Terrible things happening in France. Bombings of, of synagogues and bombings of Jewish um, uh, bake bakeries and butchers. And I mean, anti-Semitism is alive and well in the world right now. And, and, and those of us who are Jewish are aware of it because we're Jewish. Those who turn in, turn themselves on to understanding it are the ones we need to join us and help fight it. It's alive, and Lithuania is just one of the places. Thank you for asking. Yeah. About what? About what? Sure. Did you want to say something, Myrna? Oh, wait, finish your question. I'm sorry. Sure. Myrna, did you want to say something? Oh, yes. Hans. Let's in. Hans Angers, who was a friend of Anne Frank, well, went to school with Anne Frank, um, who comes to the Holocaust lectures all the time and uh, is a speaker as a survivor um, and is a really fabulous testament to survival and making it. So the tree, um, well, you heard the story of how the grove took place. So then, because we had the grove, and I don't know if you or Christopher or somebody saw the call for uh, proposals. Might have been David. David Somm, for whom the grove is named. His family were in, in Auschwitz. Um, so Myrna wrote it, the proposal, with Christopher, who is the man in charge of put to, pardon me, and Bob Close, a guy who's a, a, a writer. 
And so they put together this fabulous proposal with pictures and superimposing on the site, and a picture of the tree and a picture of Anne Frank. I mean, it was very powerful, glossy, you know, nothing I could have done. And um, we cleaned it up, we sent it off, and the next thing we knew, the Anne Frank Foundation, which had been given 11 saplings from the original tree, um, we were chosen. And so in December of, I think it was four years ago now, this little spindly tree came. It was about that high. And it had to go into quarantine because it had been in uh, the Netherlands all this time and it needed to be sure that it didn't have mold and fungus. It's a horse chestnut. And so uh, he kept it in secret in a greenhouse uh, all by itself and we would go visit it, you know, and watch it grow. It was just fabulous. And then uh, three years ago, it was the year I retired as dean, so it's almost three years, we had this planting ceremony and um, the Dutch Consul General from San Francisco came and we had speeches and hoopla. Oh, and then it was really sweet. We put the tree in the dirt, in the dirt, and then everybody who was there shoveled dirt, like when you're at a funeral. But instead, it was, you know, to give life to this beautiful tree. And then we put the fence around it, and you know, now it's it, it, it's really a very beautiful tree, and it's going to grow huge, and it's got a life of maybe 150 years, and eventually the fence will be large and large. Please, Myrna's integral to this. helpful so that it ended up supporting it you know but it didn't in, in, inflame like the Pope you know I mean uh, you know they're Catholic a lot of Catholics in Lithuania Pope and what do you have some knowledge of that someone has knowledge of that Sorry about that. 
Um, I'm going back because I feel like I had a smorgasbord of Lithuania, but I didn't have a full meal of Lithuania. I want to go deeper. Uh, I want to spend more time in Kupiskus. I'd like to go back into the archives. Um, I'm going to go to Estonia and Latvia as well, because that region, the Baltic region, is it's fabulous. I mean, I had no idea. You know, people go to Italy. Thank you. 